SCP-001, Memento Mori. Memento Mori is a Latin phrase meaning remember death, or in other words, remember that life is finite and death comes no matter what. Death is a common occurrence in the SCP universe, of course, and most people working for the SCP Foundation are well aware that death is waiting around any corner. There are some individuals, though, notably the O5 Council, that typically seek to prolong their lives for as long as possible. This SCP-001 proposal shows a time when those efforts ultimately come to an end, and death comes for even them. It goes without saying that, like any of the 001 proposals, this one is canon only if you want it to be canon. In a surprising turn, this file is classified as Clearance Level 001-1 by the Administrator of the Foundation, and all Foundation personnel are permitted and encouraged to read it. The personnel reading the file currently, however, is 05-13. SCP-001 refers to a collection of 13 anomalous areas present within Site-01, a mansion located in rural Virginia. The mansion was constructed in the 1760s by Duke Franz C. Williams, an Austrian noble who founded the SCP Foundation and continues to serve as its administrator. Williams emigrated from Europe during the Seven Years' War which, due to the number of anomalies present during the conflict, is also regarded as the first occult war. Williams arrived in America with a private party of 12, who would become the first overseers of the Foundation when it was eventually formed during the American Civil War. It became customary for new overseers to make their own additions to the mansion, often with anomalous effects. Access to the site was severely restricted until very recently, but, much like this document, Foundation personnel are permitted to make trips to the mansion to observe it themselves. The first anomalous area is the Bridge Archive, an underground storage area holding approximately 2,000 historical artifacts from the early 18th century to the late 21st. Obviously, this article takes place a good deal into the future. The vast majority of these artifacts are not anomalous, but handling any of them while within the area subjects the handler to a sudden burst of visions, typically associated with the object's historical context. For example, touching a Spanish naval cannon induces a vision of a single Spanish galleon approaching a larger English man-o-war and its escorts, possibly in the Caribbean. The galleon is sporting this unique cannon at the bow of the ship, and fires at the man o war. The cannonball collides with the ship, and seconds later, a number of massive tentacles rise from the depths and crush the man o war, with a gigantic eye visible below the water. Touching another object, a French cavalry sword, produces a vision of a battlefield in France, with French troops huddling in a trench while distant screaming is heard overhead. The screaming suddenly stops, and the French troops rush out of the trench. On the other end of the battlefield, a swirling sphere of wings and music begins screaming again. The vision then cuts to after the battle, with the field covered in corpses, and O5-1 is standing over the fallen body of an angel, pulling the sword from it. There's also an attached file, written by O5-1, in which he blames himself for the loss of a couple of cities and says that everything is worse now. The administrator then adds a note about O5-1, a man named Django, who was responsible for creating this archive. The administrator says that he met Django just after World War I, as he had been one of many paranormal experts hired by various governments to assist with the war effort. The pay was good and he had freedom to experiment, but ultimately he realized that his work was just being used to kill more young men, so he quit and drifted across Europe. The administrator knew of him by reputation and they became fast friends, with the idea of an organization free of politics being immensely attractive. Nine years later, Django became the Foundation's Overseer Alpha, eventually changed to 05-1. 
Django had always been obsessed with history, with a collection of mostly non-anomalous artifacts in his family castle, which became the basis for the archive. He was dead set on the Foundation remaining neutral throughout the years, and he was the reason that they remained painfully neutral during the Cold War and during the conflict in Samothrace. He believed that even though men were dying, more men would die if they intervened. The administrator writes that the Foundation could never stay neutral forever, as the insurgency crisis proved that. He never filled Django's seat, and thinks that that was the beginning of the end. Area 02 is a converted bedroom in the East Wing, filled with 30 monitors and televisions mounted to the walls. These screens constantly display a variety of global information, from the daily NASDAQ numbers to precipitation levels of the Middle East. None of the screens are connected to anything except each other. One screen permanently displays the rate of traffic flow on all major American and European highways, with a note stating, Driver rate needs monitoring. Fluctuations unclear. May be indicative. It then says to get in touch with the GOC, as they owe him. Another screen shows a shifting graph of the prevalence of anomalous tool use at Foundation sites, with a note reading that this risks a dominance scenario, and it's urgent that he address the Council about this. Attached is also a few emails, the first of which was from 05-2 to Reza, the record keepers of the Foundation, demanding every bit of data that came out of Kabul before the bombs started falling. He writes that they're in crisis mode, as it's their job to make sure things like this never happen, and they messed up, so now they need to use the data to prevent it from ever happening again. The second email is from the administrator to 05-2, telling him that he needs to calm down, as they can't change the past. If all of his staff are terrified of him and hanging on by a thread, they can't do anything about the future. He urges him to not become obsessed. 05-2 responds by saying that he'll take 200 burned out staffers over one more corpse any day. The administrator's note about 05-2, a man named David, explains that he met him after the Gulf incident in 2028, when Dave was working as a lowly tech in the record keeping department of the foundation. The administrator saw something in him though a fiery talent for putting pieces together and taking information considered worthless and forming it into something useful. He gave Dave some trial runs and found him to be a very impressive, if acerbic, young man, and promoted him to 05-2 after the last one retired. Information is paramount at the Foundation, and he was the best there was at it, once able to figure out a chaos insurgency attack plan based on annual ammunition sales in Libya, crossed with Anderson Robotics stock prices. Unfortunately, he fell into a classic trap of becoming paranoid. As things became easier and started to calm down, he believed that it was because he was missing things. Every little accident or statistical improbability became his fault, and he blamed himself for events entirely out of his control. It came to the point where it wasn't enough to just solve the puzzle, he had to be the only one who had the answer. He went early, even by normal standards, as the administrator found him slumped over in his room, watching Powerball drawings. Area 03 is a warehouse on the outer grounds that has been remodeled into a workshop containing machinery and implements from a variety of time periods. Any item crafted with the tools and machinery in the area will carry some sort of minor anomalous effect with it. Most are anomalously improved at their given function, such as body armor that protects the wearer from damage, or a lockpick able to open any lock. One object, a solid state computer drive labeled as practice.exe, contains an AI named Sophie, able to hold and maintain casual conversation beyond what it would be capable of considering its storage capacity. Another, a small crib mobile resembling the solar system with a tenth planet included, causes observers to fall into a state of relaxation. This item was labeled as Aggie's Baby before being crossed out. 
In an attached file, the administrator approached 05 3, Everett Mann, and tells him that they're having a get together for 05 7, and it would be nice to have him there. He could maybe bring a gift for her child. Mann stays silent for a moment before replying that he doesn't think so, as he has stuff to finish up here. The administrator leaves, telling him not to work too hard. In the administrator's note, he says that Mann was good, and he liked him. He was a former member of Prometheus Labs, and when he came to the Foundation, he designed more efficient machines, containment chambers, and sometimes even weapons. He built the devices that eventually replaced the Scranton Reality Anchors, and designed the Foundation's first spaceship. He writes that man was a true prodigy that you see once in a generation, but he was odd, as you had to really push to talk to him. He preferred to stay huddled in his workshop all day and night, and the administrator isn't sure if he couldn't connect with people because he was always working, or if he was always working because he couldn't connect, or neither. They never found out what happened to him, as he just disappeared one day, and despite the biggest manhunt in the world, the administrator never found so much as a hair. He thinks that maybe man didn't want to be found, but he couldn't fill the 05-3 seat after that, as it would be admitting the obvious. Area 04 is a private library in the West Wing, containing a variety of texts and books on various anomalous phenomena. Most of these books were written in the past, but some will be written in the future, while others will never be written, so they don't technically exist. The library was placed in the mansion via a ritual aimed at amputating a portion of the Wanderer's Library, an anomalous location containing all possible knowledge. The ritual did succeed, as we can see, but it resulted in the caster being utterly annihilated. An attached file contains a small section of an index listing a few titles, Three of them, related to the Serpent's Hand, have been removed. There's also a set of post-it notes with hasty pencil drawings depicting the Wanderer's Library, labeled as SCP-7984, with the corner of the topmost one wet. 05-4 was Tilda Moose, a defector of the Serpent's Hand, a group that makes their headquarters in the Wanderer's Library. The administrator writes that a hand member defecting to the Foundation is the rarest of the rare. He doesn't know much about her though, and if she had access to the library, she could have come from any reality, not necessarily this one. It took him a long time to trust her, with her becoming 05-4 30 years after the two meeting. She became one of the Foundation's most valued assets though a living encyclopedia of magic, and with knowledge of how to disrupt the Serpent's Hand, who were pretty much gone by 2049, aside from the Ninth Occult War. Although the Council has had anomalous members before, they've never had an honest-to-god wizard like Tilda, but he says that she was one of the most loyal people he's ever met. Whatever the Hand did to piss her off, she never forgave them with her joy in ruining them only matched by her thirst for knowledge. In the end though, that was what did her in, as she lost access to the library upon joining the Foundation. Even though she knew what she was signing up for, he doesn't think she fully understood how important the library was to her. She would give anything to have her access restored, but in the end, she ended up giving everything. Area 05 is a large greenhouse and conservatory inside the gardens behind the mansion. It contains a number of colorful plants that no longer exist anywhere else in the world, with no records of them existing outside of Foundation control. They are plants that were supposedly found on a fey island that have been meticulously reconstructed. One shrub with small white flowers which secrete a milky white substance has a placard noting that the substance has abnormal healing properties, and perhaps some should be sent to 05-9. Another plant, an aquatic fern with purple leaves, can be ground into a paste effective against magical wards. The placard notes that the seeds came from 05-5's mother. 
In the attached note from 05-5, she apologizes for the mess and says that she's just sick of it all and feels like she's doing everything wrong. She asks whoever reads it to make sure her dad doesn't find out about this, but finishes by writing that it's about time. In the administrator's note, he says that 05-5, Chelsea, was one he never expected to have as an overseer, being a half-blood fairy. He remarks that the Foundation's relationship with the Fey folk is riddled with lies, violence, and tragedy on both sides. The Fey population was decimated back in 88, although there were some still around. Chelsea was the result of a union between a Foundation agent and a Fey, giving her a chance at a career with the Foundation and the benefits of Fey magic. She had some adversity, but rose to the ranks quickly, ultimately being recommended for the O5 position by her predecessor. She always struggled with supporting and leading an organization that was such an enemy of her people. Decades of moral conflict built up inside of her until she couldn't take it anymore. This greenhouse was the closest thing to her homeland she had, so maybe that's why she ended things here. Area 06 is a bedroom in the West Wing, renovated and redecorated in the style of traditional Middle Eastern homes. Touching any of the decorations in the room results in the hookah sitting on a low table to produce a light smoke. Hailing the smoke causes the subject to experience a strong vision. For example, touching a small flag of the Piercing Sun movement results in a vision of the city of Ariat, mentioned to have fallen at some point in the past. The vision shows the flags of the Piercing Sun government everywhere, with loudspeakers loudly proclaiming the current date of September 5th, 2039, and that the Horizon Initiative has beat back another separatist movement. The streets are notably empty. The Horizon Initiative is a group consisting of various sects of the main three Abrahamic religions focused on containing or destroying anomalies in the name of religion. Touching a quilted blanket on the bed results in a vision of a market in an Afghan village, showing a woman kneeling in a small shop while sewing a rug. A muted television shows an aerial view of Kabul in ruins. The subject witnessing the vision will cry after it ends, but won't be able to explain why. In the attached file, 056 is arguing with the administrator about the situation in Kabul which the council just voted on whether or not to get involved. The administrator showed up just to invalidate 05-6's vote, as he didn't want him to rush into a fight he doesn't know anything about, especially after 05-1's death. The council of 13 is down to only 10 members at this point, and the administrator urges caution from the rest of them. In his note, he writes that 05-6, Ali, was from somewhere in the Middle East, and even though he drifted from country to country, he loved it with all his heart. The Foundation doesn't have a great reputation in the region, so they wanted Ali to join them as an expert on local paranormal phenomena. The ORIA, of course, were also interested in him, being a group of interest devoted to anomalies in the Middle East. The Foundation convinced him to join them instead, and then sent him to the ORIA as a spy, in the end, he became directly responsible for the strong relations the Foundation has over there now. He was eventually outed as a spy, though, and was brought back to the US for an administrative job, eventually reaching the Council. The Foundation never managed to stabilize the region, and Ali had bet his entire life on the Foundation instead of the ORIA. When the chaos insurgency struck Kabul, he tried to fix his mistakes but the administrator stopped him. Afterwards, he drank until his liver gave out, and then drank some more. Area 07 is a wooden gazebo in the gardens, containing an arbor which causes subjects who step through it to be transported to one of two extra-dimensional locations. None of the subjects' actions here will affect anything, and no one will acknowledge their presence. The first location is a small wedding in progress on a raiding day, where the bride and groom kiss under the arbor to applause from two dozen other individuals. 
The group then mingles, and the bride can be seen lightly touching her belly. The second location is a funeral in progress on a cloudy day, with a portrait of the woman standing on an easel. The casket is closed, on a table inside the gazebo, and a dozen or so individuals are standing nearby. The man stands at the edge of the gazebo, looking out at the mansion with no emotions on his face. In the attached email from 05-7 to 01, she tells him to get off his high horse for shaming her about taking actions where he won't. She writes that the people in Samothrace are dying by the day, and the piercing sun is still marching to Adiat, and they need to evacuate who they can, even if 01 is too much of a coward to work with the GOC. The administrator writes that 05-7, Agatha, was the best of the council, talented and loving. Her rise through the ranks of the Foundation was meteoric, and she was almost going to be on the Ethics Committee instead, due to her strong sense of morality. She met 05-13 long before joining the Council, with the Administrator only finding out about their relationship a week before their wedding. He believed that married overseers was a road to disaster, but it wasn't his place to say, and he's glad they were at least happy together. They made an odd couple, with 13 being a bureaucrat and Agatha a maverick, but they brought out the best in each other. He finishes by noting that she had a lot of love to give, but she died in childbirth. He doesn't know what happened to the child, as he left that to 05-13, who he says was good, but never quite the same. Area 08 is a large, non-functional machine in the mansion's basement with an unknown purpose. 05-8 described it as a time machine, however. It has sustained heavy damage, including scratches and scorch marks. The interior consists of a small space with a seat and controls, alongside a small shrine with mundane memorabilia. One item is a small black disc that, when pressed, displays a holographic photo of two men with a small child as the child cuts a birthday cake. Another item is a crumpled paper receipt for a Salomon implant repair in New Portland. No such store exists at the given address, but the date, repeatedly underlined in black marker, is September 16th, 2154. An attached file transcribes an excerpt from an 05 council meeting, in which 05-08 suddenly asks the others if they think about when they're going to die. The administrator showed up out of the blue and told him that this discussion isn't productive, suggesting that he go take a lie down. In the administrator note, he writes that 05-08, Thaddeus, is another one he truly didn't expect as he came from the future. He told them more than enough to confirm he was from a future version of the Foundation, and warned them about group of interest movements, containment breaches, and significant historical events. He told them enough to direct the Foundation where it needed to go, but never really talked about other parts of the future he came from, saying that it risked causing a paradox or causality. He had the unfortunate side effect of knowing how, when, and where each of his colleagues would die, including the administrator himself. He never told them any of the details, but he carried the weight on his shoulders. Eventually, he couldn't bear it any longer. He couldn't bear talking to each of them as if he didn't know the exact circumstances of their demise. The administrator finishes by writing that, he deserved a better end to his story. Area 09 is a medicine cabinet in the bathroom of a private bedroom in the Eastern Wing. It contains a number of unlabeled pill bottles containing an array of medicines and narcotics. Consuming these medicines results in variable but positive health effects, able to suppress medical conditions considered to be debilitating even by modern science. One pill, stamped with a W, causes immediate short-lasting euphoria by altering a person's brain chemistry. 
The bottle containing these pills is completely full and still sealed. Another pill, stamped with a foundation seal, causes the gradual loss of a long-term memory. One of the pills in the blister pack has been used. Two letters are also contained nearby, one still sealed with the word grandfather written on it. There is no return address on it, and it's covered in a thick layer of dust. Another letter, found in the wastebasket, consists of the words, Thomas, by the time you get this, I... The administrator writes that they used to joke that 05-09, Gene, was a lich due to his age and personality. He was grumpy, irritable, resistant to change, and required a small pharmacy to make it through each day. He was the oldest man the administrator ever met before he became an overseer, and he previously had worked his whole life to become the director of Site-19. He made a good overseer, sharp despite his age, and shrewd because of it. The administrator thinks that he was the only one Gene respected. Being in Foundation administration generally extends your life, due to having the highest quality healthcare in the world, and being on the council is the peak of that, due to drinking from the Fountain of Youth, SCP-006. As he was already old when brought onto the council, he was on the path to beat 05-01 as the longest living human on the planet. Then one day he decided he didn't want to do it anymore, although the administrator doesn't know exactly why. He had one of his employees wheel him out to the hills north of the mansion so that he could watch the sunrise alone. There, he turned off his own oxygen, and his body was cold by the time someone got there. Area 10 is a large dog bed inside of 05-03's workshop, pushed against the northern wall and covered in dust. A photo of a golden retriever is pinned to the wall behind it, and a number of items, including a leash and chew toy, sit on the bed. Touching any of these items result in the subject being transported to the southern shore of the pond on the mansion grounds. The attached file consists of a to-do list, listing a number of projects, such as Samsara, Olympia, and Deepwell, some of which are crossed off, and some aren't. Number six on the list is Back to Normal, which is uncrossed. Number eight was apparently a test with SCP-343 labeled as Deific Entity Neutralization, and number nine was to figure out Kabul Recovery Plan. 05-10, Kane Pathos Crow, is a Foundation doctor that was famously turned into a canine due to an anomalous event, which didn't prevent his continued employment with the Foundation. The administrator writes that Crow was a true genius, and in some ways getting turned into a dog possibly made him smarter, as he began to think in ways no human ever possibly could. The administrator recognizes the hilarity in having a dog as an overseer, but says that Crow was one of the best men he ever had the pleasure of working with, even if he wasn't a man. They used a lot of his tech after the Six Minute War, and even more of it after 2050. He was also friendly in a dog-like way, always looking at the best in people, even when they had done nothing to earn his friendliness. Unfortunately. He was a dog, and dogs die a lot faster than humans. They fought biology as best as they could, but they all saw this coming. Crow made his arrangements in advance, and didn't want to go in pain. He spent his last day indulging in his instincts, chasing birds and playing with the others. All thirteen of the overseers and the administrator went for a walk around midday, and they passed the pond where Crow said this is where he wanted to do it. He walked in a circle three times and laid down with his eyes closed. The administrator likes to think that the syringe didn't hurt him too bad. Area 11 is a small armory in the mansion's basement, with a variety of firearms and traditional weapons arranged on the walls. Touching any of the weapons displays a particular scar on the subject's body, which disappears after letting go of the weapon. 
One weapon, a vibro spear used on the moon during the Solidarity campaign, causes a bite mark to appear on the subject's calf, the teeth marks of which don't correspond to any possible human dental set or known animal set. Another weapon, a custom hand cannon with a rotating barrel emblazoned with the logo of the Foundation Agents Corporation, causes 15 large knife wounds to appear across the subject's chest, neck, and arms. In the attached file, 05-11 writes to the administrator, telling him to stop worrying about him. He's been doing this since way before having a desk job, he has the best security detail on the planet, and he's going to a site nobody even knows about. He tells the administrator to focus on filling the other 05 seats before worrying about what happens if his goes empty. He promises that he'll be fine. In the administrator's note, he says that 05-11, Troy, had the unfortunate fate of being too good at his job. He had apparently been an extremely talented field agent, but the administrator didn't want someone like him to waste his time in the Foundation by following up on Bigfoot rumors. Troy had the condition of being able to take on field jobs if he wanted, upon promotion to administration. Unfortunately, he had less and less time for field work as he rose in rank, but he was damn good at his job. He accepted the job of overseer not because he wanted it, but because he thought he should, as he was altruistic like that. Some people aren't fit for that life though filled with intrigue, pettiness, and messy politics, while Troy was a simple, down-to-earth guy. Despite that, he was good at being behind a desk as well. In 2063, though, he decided that he was needed at a site in the Levant, towards the tail end of the crisis. None of them were really sure which of their personnel were still truly loyal to the Foundation, but Troy believed that people needed to see their leaders, so that they could see they weren't scared. One of Troy's bodyguards turned out to be not so loyal though, and even though he put up a hell of a fight and killed the man, he bled out in the car on the way to the site. The administrator writes that, knowing Troy, that's probably exactly how he'd wanted to go out. Area 12 is a bar cart in an auxiliary office in the mansion, filled with a large variety of liquor and alcohol. The bottles in the cart never run out, but upon being poured into a glass, the liquid will change into another liquid, generally non-potable or toxic. One bottle containing an aged whiskey changes into warm, bitter water containing trace amounts of sulfur. Another. A jug of moonshine changes into freezing cold, hard water, which scalds the throat when drunk and induces unconsciousness. This jug is nearly empty. In the attached file, it shows a conversation between 0512, 13, and the administrator, apparently the only ones left of the council. They share a drink of scotch, and they all agree that they had a good run. In the administrator's note, he says that 05-12, Alto Clef, deserved what he got. The only reason he made it on the council was because the Foundation needed a strong, capable military leader during the insurgency crisis. Clef was a deranged maniac, but they've had a lot of deranged maniacs, and they needed one at the time. He did his job and beat back the enemy as they waged war with the insurgency in Asia, Africa, and even the Antarctic. Clef didn't know what to do after the war was over, as the council was not an action-packed job. He mellowed out and became the kind of guy you could drink with instead of the guy who started bar fights. None of the other overseers spent much time around him due to the things he did way back. One day, he went looking for a fight and got one, but the administrator says that what happened isn't really important. He finishes by writing that, after Clef was dead and buried, he swears to God he saw the sun blink, just for a moment. That just leaves Area 13, a small graveyard in the outer grounds of the mansion. There are 13 gravestones arranged in a grid, 
each bearing an inscription that changes depending on the reader, conforming to their relationship with the subject of the tombstone. We're given a list of messages as recorded by 05-13. 01. Here lies Django Bridge, an archivist to the end. 02. Here lies David Rosen, never saw it coming. 03. Here lies Everett Mann, could make anything except happiness, an empty grave. 04. Here lies Tilda Moose, didn't know what she had until she gave it away, died trying to get it back. 05. Here lies Chelsea Elliott, nay Glaistig, feet in two worlds, fit in neither. Zero 06. Here lies Ali ibn Bihan, betrayed his countrymen, died of the guilt. Zero 07. Here lies Agatha Wrights, the only one I have ever loved. 08. Here lies Thaddeus Zank. Came from tomorrow to help us today. Never forgot what he left behind. 09. Here lies Jean Actus, a relic of the past, but he knew that. 10. Here lies Cain Pathos Crow. He was a good boy. 11. Here lies Troy Lament, the best I have ever known. 12. Here lies Alto Clef, rot in hell. 13. Memento Mori. The administrator's note then addresses 05-13, Dr. Gears, who is the one reading this file. He writes that it's been 80 years now. And after getting Gears onto senior staff, then directorship, and then the council, he knows him well enough to know what he does when he's thinking about ending things. The administrator says that it's okay, as he's been here before the council, and he'll be here after. They ran the place well, but at the end of the day, they're still human. They make mistakes, and they have flaws, and that's all right. He can't help but feel responsible for the crushing burden the council members have felt, as this life isn't an easy one. They were each the best and the brightest of the Foundation, and he took them and ruined them. He tells Gears not to worry about what will happen afterwards, as the administrator's office has a handle on things since he stopped refilling the seats. It's time to start burying the past to make room for the future. There will never be a group like this again, and that's okay, as the mere existence of the Council seems to invite tragedy. He admits that he doesn't know what will be next, but the age of the Council is over. He finishes by telling Gears to come to his study when he's ready to end it, and that it's okay. He did a good job, and the Administrator is proud of him. When most fans of the SCP universe think of the O5 Council, they'll conjure up images of shadowy figures who lack morality about the things they do in the name of protection. It's rare that we're given such an exceedingly human look at the members of the Council, individuals that are heavily entwined with the anomalous but are human nonetheless. Individuals that bleed, cry, worry, ponder, and ultimately, die. It's certainly not an enviable job, as though they are given prolonged lives, it's only for the purpose of continuing their thankless work. It's not a surprise that most of them chose to end their own lives once they couldn't bear it any longer, and almost none of them had any real happiness in their lives. Above all of them is the administrator, a figure that doesn't see himself as human any longer, who has to stand by and watch as all of these individuals come and go. 
He's sorry for all the pain he's caused by bringing them onto the council, and has come to the decision that the Foundation needs to go forward without a council from now on. Perhaps he's realized that there are better ways for the Foundation to be run, or perhaps he just doesn't want to bear witness to the continued tragedy of losing council members. Now that they're gone, though, he encourages everyone at the Foundation to look upon their lives and to make sure that they're remembered. <laughs>